actress, um, Mickey Lewis, and she has been a client of mine for, hello. Uh, and there's Aunt and there's Golda. She's been a client of mine for like nearly 20 years, I think, close. Wow. And I but have- it was also, longer, Josie. Well, <laughs> it was longer. <laughs> How we're old is Golda? Golden Retriever. Whoa. This is the what? The, we're on the fourth Golden Retriever. Right, right. We're on the fourth Golden Retriever. Although but one I of call, them was a rescue. How old yeah. was Amber? 13 when we got her? She was. So she was owned by a girl who's, it's a long story, but her mother had died and she was going off to vet school in Scotland oh. and her, the dog was staying with her dad and the dog went through separation anxiety because the dog lost her mom and mm -hmm. they put the dog on Prozac and the dog was just shut down and Mickey lived a few blocks away. And so I said, why don't we go ask her if we could just move Amber over to Mickey's house? And, and the famous last words were, maybe we ought to meet the dog. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. How old is Golda now? Walk away from a dog that needed rescue. Well, Golda, and then Golda's story, she, when Mickey got Golda, she looked like a gold, she looked like a cocker spaniel with no hair. Oh, wow. I'm and not all kidding. the bones showing. And all the bones showing. And these people had wanted a smaller dog than a golden retriever. So they tried to do the goldfish bowl thing with Golda, Golda and just keep her small by keeping her in a crate and not feeding her like i, oh, I don't know that's I, bad yeah and so um i mean mickey i call mickey the betty crocker of raw dog food <laughs> and i have actually <laughs> wanted to do a cooking show with her because when i met her she was already feeding the barf diet she was already um her dogs got ground up chicken necks and turkey necks they get put out on the back porch every afternoon with a raw chicken back and she was already doing it and she couldn't find a vet who was she could tell that she was feeding that way. <laughs> but how did you learn how to feed that way? Because you were feeding that way when I met you. Yes. Already. I made a friend when our first golden retriever was young. First of all, let me say that we lost a beautiful Sheltie to cancer before we got the first golden retriever. And I took my Sheltie to a CDX title. He was just a magnificent dog. Mm -hmm. And losing him to cancer was really heartbreaking. Well, losing any dog is, but I decided then that the rate of cancer seemed to have increased statistically with the increased rise of dog sale, dog food sales. And when Benji was a puppy, um, I had now a friend. When, this was what, back in the 90s, probably, right? 80s? About 90s? 1991. There you go. Okay, just to give people a frame of reference. <laughs> okay, so um, I had a friend who raised and who actually bred and trained Mal Malinois mm -hmm. and he had his dogs on a raw food diet so he was the first one to tell me about the barf diet and I started doing research online and the more I read and the more I learned the more it made sense to me you wouldn't adopt a kid and feed him a can of Chef Boyardee every day, seven days a week. Oh. And Some people basically wouldn't. he convinced me that if it came out of a bag or a can, it was most likely poison. So that was how I got started. 
And by the time I met Josie, I'd already had two vets tell me that I was nuts and that I could just go to Publix and buy whatever was on the shelf. And that was the best thing I could do for my dog, that I didn't know enough to create proper nutrition for an animal. And at that time, I was still dealing with a kid who had very severe food allergies, actually three kids with very severe food allergies. So I kind of knew my way around different diets. And by the time I met Josie, I, she asked me what I was feeding my dog. And I was embarrassed to tell her because all these other people had made fun of me. And when I explained to Josie what I was doing, she said, if the dog weren't already on that diet, I'd be recommending it. And that was like real validation for me that, yeah, I was doing something right. And with Josie's help, I've expanded it to include answers, fermented milk products. Um, I've added raw chicken necks, as well as the raw backs. Um, I've added things like watermelon and sweet potato and pumpkin that Josie recommended. Um, so my dogs think that cucumber slices are cookies. They think that the bits and pieces that you cut off from Brussels sprouts are cookies. <laughs> I dehydrate, I grind up and then I puree and then dehydrate chicken necks and chicken hearts. And that becomes their treats. Um, so there's no artificial anything. There's nothing added. Um, and you have a system, like one reason I wanted, I wanted to talk to you is to tell people that, I mean, you figured out most of this yourself. And back in 1991, there wasn't there, we didn't have the big internet resources. So you were probably looking at books and stuff. Cause I know you're an avid reader, but you put together a system of like do it yourself feeding and you rotate around you rotate through things as well but i wanted to go through that a little bit because you have like your meat mixture right and then you have your vegetable fruit mixture which is a much smaller percentage but that's to bring in fiber and things like that um so you found in sourcing meat is actually always a big issue as well but you found you were initially i remember you were going to Publix and you made friends with the butchers there and had them grind up things for you right and then one day i showed up to pick up an order mm -hmm. and was told oh we can't do that anymore Mm -hmm. But what were they grinding? They were doing all kinds of stuff for you there. They were. Yes, they were kind of open up. people's minds to the possibilities that are out there. When well, they were grinding up chicken necks. Turkey. And then I was adding in um, chicken livers and chicken hearts for the organ meat mm -hmm. um, just in my blender at home. Mm -hmm. But then when they stopped grinding the chicken necks for me, I said, okay, you better order a grinder and find a resource for chicken necks. And over the years, first Publix ordered cases of chicken necks for me. And I would grind up 40 pounds of chicken necks at a time. Wow. Um and freeze it and then take it out as I needed it for the dogs and the cats. Um, and then you're putting, are you putting other meats in there or you're putting the organ meats in there? To begin with, to be honest with you, no. Mm -hmm. But once you and I started talking and I started learning from you, then I started adding beef heart, beef liver, tripe mm -hmm. if I can get it. Um, 
they get chicken livers and chicken hearts, but if I can't find the beef liver, then it's chicken liver. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you kind of go with what you what's available as well. Right, yeah. and the same thing, well, that gets ground up. And once I defrost, the percentage, by the way, is 70% chicken necks, 20% mm -hmm. yeah. beef hearts, and 10% beef liver. Mm -hmm. Now, once I defrost a two pound container of that, I then add a can of whole wild caught sardines. Mm -hmm. And I break that up into the meat mixture. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically the meat diet. If I can't get chicken necks, I do turkey necks. Um, I've talked to, I'm now using a butcher down south of me and I've talked to him about getting rabbit, mm -hmm. getting venison. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, chicken is getting harder to find and I'm willing to accommodate as long as I can have the bone meat balance that we need mm -hmm. for the calcium and the phosphate and potassium that Mm -hmm. you find in the chicken necks. So I've learned to be somewhat flexible, but still try to stick to the basic meat plan. Yeah. yeah. The fruits and vegetables, uh, if you can't find blueberries, use watermelon. If you can't find watermelon, use cranberries. Um, so that varies based on what I can find. Yeah, and I'm gonna, I mean, I have you put together kind of a list for me on this stuff. Um, so like the vegetables, anything from kale, collard greens, carrots, spinach, green beans, spinach, broccoli, zucchini, some garlic, apple, orange, watermelon, blueberries, cranberries, sweet potato, and yeah, sweet potato. So, I mean, that's a, if you look at that, that sounds really super healthy. It sounds really Well, yummy. I also added pumpkin, mm -hmm. thanks to your suggestion. So yeah, I make a bowl more like this. Fiber. I grind up a bowl like this, and to that I add a can of pureed pumpkin. And the other thing I've added to try to increase the fiber is pumpkin seed mm -hmm. that I grind up when I'm grinding everything else. Well, you know, pumpkin seed is a really good dewormer. Pumpkin seed removes um, intestinal parasites. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we haven't had that problem with the dogs, and maybe yeah. that's why. I mean, I don't see she now has she she has a standard poodle as well as this golden retriever. But like with Golda, she yeah. didn't have any hair on her, and uh, Mickey was like, I was just like, start her on the diet. She's the animals that have come into her house. She just starts some cold turkey on the diet, and real food, and she that's her standard poodle baby. <laughs> um, okay. She's got her, she's training her so that she's like a, a, not a therapy dog, but to help her because she's had vertigo issues and some falling. So the standard poodle is helping her get around now and going to rehab and everything. Um, but yeah, Golda came, grew into, yeah, that is her, her harness and stuff. So Golda grew into a full grown female golden retriever, even though I forget how old she was when you got her. We she don't was, know for sure. And, and you she, said that because of the starvation, her growth yeah, yeah. had been stunted and even yeah. her dental was behind where it should have been. But it all came out good. I mean, her teeth are good. She's got beautiful feathers back on her hind legs. Her coat is gorgeous. Oh, and then the story with her too, we forgot. <laughs> we forgot this little detail, Mickey. She had got a tumor on her left shoulder, a soft tissue sarcoma. And um, Mickey took her in to several surgeons. And the first thing was like, well, we have to do radiation and chemo and surgery and cut the dog's leg off. They wanted to amputate her front leg and she might live, I don't know what they told her she would live. I mean, this was like, see, this was years ago. This was several years ago mind you um this was like 
five years ago? It's five years ago. This is five years ago. And I insisted and in, in surgery when they yeah. took the thing out. It looked very encapsulated to me. And it felt very encapsulated. So that was, I was pushing to get a surgeon just to go in and take, get good margins, but just take the tumor out and leave the leg alone. She hunted all over Miami to try to find somebody essentially. And they did, they went in and took this, the surgeon went in and took this tumor out. We were just talking about this. What did they do? They well, they took the tumor out, and of course, we sent it for a path report, mm -hmm. and it came back as a soft tumor sarcoma, and that vet was the one who called me and said, we need to amputate the leg, yeah. and dogs do very well on three legs, and I thought to myself, if they do so well on three legs, why did God give them four? So... I'm, I'm not a big believer in invasive surgery, if at all avoidable. And then I went to the oncology specialist That's who right. gave me the choice of more radical surgery to make sure we got it all, which would probably leave her partially crippled. A year of chemo and radiation and I happened to be sitting in the waiting room long enough to chat with a woman who had a dog in her lap who was going through the chemo and radiation. And she was sharing with me just how violently ill this dog was every day in between the treatments. And then I talked to Dr. Josie and she said, why don't we put her on some oriental herbs and see how she does? Well, at 14 and a half, Golda looks better than she's looked in her life. She's got- put her, Yeah, we put her on, well, I put her on the Chinese herbs. I put her on medicinal mushrooms. She was already on this diet. And um, yeah, that was pretty much it, honestly. And she's, she looks wonderful. She's and never she back. acts like a puppy. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, the poodle and the golden retriever think that they are each other's favorite toys. <laughs> so, plus we have two cats and the dogs and the cats get along just fine. Yeah, yeah. But the diet sort of grew from what I now admit was a very basic meat mixture to include more organ meat. It also expanded with Josie's suggestion to do the answers fermented milk products. Goat milk, yeah. I also add a splash of bone broth to their meals every day. Um, so the more I learn, Dr. Josie suggested the phytosynergy, so they get that sprinkled on their food every day. So the more I learn, the more I adapt this diet so that they're getting a variety of fruits and vegetables and a variety of meat with bones and the organ meat to enhance that. Yeah. And what do you, so you just, how, for your preparation, do you take like, you, you do, do you do it once a week? Do you do it once every couple of weeks, the, the meal prep? Generally, if you buy a head of collard greens, uh -huh. you then have to buy a pound of carrots and a pound of kale. I mean, it ends up being a very large work bowl that is full to overflowing. And so I package that in containers and freeze it. And I'm fortunate that I have the freezer space to do that because when I make the fruits and vegetables, it's about a three month supply. Oh, wow. Wow. But that's but awesome. It's, 
you know, you know it's several hours of work, but then yeah. I don't have to do it again for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And this is kind of what I wanted people to hear is different ways that different people are doing like a do you do it yourself fresh food diet and easy ways that you can do it. It doesn't have to be complicated. And it's, you know, you're not doing some crazy formulation. You had already had your basics and it's interesting chicken necks. Now people are, now there's this whole thing with some chicken necks causing problems. Uh, Amaris may know, is there something in the chicken necks that was- um, It's- because something. some farms they inject the the antibiotics and stuff at the the neck area, or uh, you know the, or some is um the butt depend I don't know but okay it's it's basically injection site injection site yeah. yeah so I don't know I'm not an expert in this but what what I'm um curious as a pet parent is you said you've got two dogs and two cats. So um, do the cats eat the same food as the dogs or is there a different ratio percentage? Like, is there any vegetable matter in them or is it just purely meat? Okay. Um, cats are dedicated carnivores. So you kind of have to sneak the fruits and vegetables in. So I would guess that the ratio of meat to fruits and vegetables for the cats is seven to one. And you, know, you have to understand that I eyeball this. I'm not carefully measuring everything, but it's about seven to one. And with the dogs, it's the exact same food, but the ratio is four to one. It's about, yeah. So um, it's a little more difficult with the, po the poodle she's, Although she's not been as bad in the last few days, maybe I should knock on wood. Um, but she's a much pickier eater than the golden retriever. If it looks like food, Golda will eat it. So just um, to clarify for, for the listeners, when you say seven to one, that's seven, uh, the portion of meat to one cup of uh, the ratio or to the vegetable matter, is that correct? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank and again, you. I'm spooning it out of different containers. So I'm kind of eyeballing it. But that's approximately what I can get away with with the cats. And it's interesting that you say that too, because cats, animals will eat, you know, there's this whole thing of animals self medicating and stuff. And that's probably about the ratio, the max the cats really need in terms of the vegetable matter, a seven to one, you know? Really? It's interesting. Yeah, because they don't, <laughs> I think there's, there's an innate intelligence at work somewhere in there too, you know? Because I mean, some cats, my cat goes out, she gets, um, for a long time, I was feeding her the canine answers ratio, but then I was adding more goat milk and then I was adding some extra organ meats and stuff in there to hers. Um, but now she's getting, I found a company, this real meat meal for dog, real meal for pets. It's also coming out of Pennsylvania and it's they're grinding up like pure, it's like a ground up mouse kind of mixture. It's not mouse, but you know, it's much more just meat and veg, meat and organs. But the cats are doing great. And I'm, you know, the dog for, I, I forget, like even talking about Golda, I had, I had forgotten even about the soft tissue sarcoma. And some people, you know, they don't, we think of cancer that it's always going to be there and it's always something to mess with, but she's 14 and a half. It has not returned. There's no sign of her limping. There's no sign of any abnormality on that leg. It was on her right left shoulder and she's done absolutely fantastic. Um, so there, you know, it, <laughs> there are other options. And I think when you think outside the box and we get away from the fear so much, but at the same time, I mean, Mickey has really stood strong over the years of having these veterinarians literally scare her to death. And I, I remember Gabby, your the golden, a couple goldens back, he started 
I don't know, I think he was around like 11 years old or something. He started limping on his back legs. So I told her, I said, we need to get him in and get some x-rays done to see what condition his hips are in. So I, I recommended an orthopedic surgeon because I figured they're going to take good x-rays and we're going to get a good um, diagnosis from, from her. And then we can see what we need to do. And I'll, I still remember this. I got this phone call from Mickey that afternoon and she was an absolute wreck. She had to pull off the side of the road crying because she went to this orthopedic surgeon. They did x-rays on Gabby's hips and said that he had hip dysplasia. And the reason that he had hip dysplasia was the raw diet she had been feeding this dog. You know, and so she just, it hit her heart as just this spear going into her, like, oh my God, I created this in my dog and abs. And it was absolutely not. I told her, I said, if that, if he had not been on that raw diet, he probably would have been limping at the age of three or four and been half crippled. And here he was, the signs and symptoms of it didn't even show up until he was about 12 years old. So, but you know, these, it's really, I don't think doctors and veterinarians realize, and even if you aren't, even if you're talking to a friend that has a dog, saying certain things can really create a lot of harm and um, do a lot of damage, you know. Well, and I'm sure that, that you know, really she, took me up because yeah. telling me that I had caused that's horrible. My dog's problem was. You know, and I've had every veterinarian that I've spoken to, other than Josie, has made fun of the raw food diet. And Jabby was an interesting case study because when we purchased Jabby, my son purchased a male litter mate of Jabby's. Oh, that's right. And of course, they were feeding out of a bag or a can, that dog died at the age of seven. Wow. Wow. So, and these are golden retrievers and I don't, I don't know, Mickey, if you're aware that the whole golden retriever thing is up now in, in the holistic veterinary world because they did this 300 golden retriever long life study out in California. And so now people are kind of picking and choosing information out of that study and extrapolating it to all these other dogs. But your dogs weren't in that study. <laughs> I wish they would have been, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they would have rejected me. Yeah, they probably would have rejected you because there's a lot coming out of that study, which I'm like, I, you know, we got to be careful about how we interpret these things. But um, yeah, and there's no, you know, the, the vets can, people can say, oh, your raw diet caused that. How can they even, there's no evidence that they can say that. And yet now these days I'm seeing, oh my goodness, I'm seeing dogs on, commercial diets come out, come out with certain patterns of blood work that's abnormal. Like I, I saw a Rottweiler this week and it's just, this dog is really just, it's grating on my nerve. It's grating on me because um, the owner is supposedly like a fitness fanatic and into keto and, and in a, you know, supplementation for herself and doing right for herself. And she's had the dog, a nine-year-old Roddy, who's been on hydrolyzed protein diet for allergies, which means that's ground up chicken feathers. So this dog has been getting no nutrition. Um, the dog has been on, had three melanomas removed last year, and yet the dog is on daily Apoquil for food allergies. The dog is on like Gabapin, Tramadol, Galaprant for the arthritis in the legs and had to have a knee surgery that barely healed from and now has such bad muscle atrophy on the hind end, she can't stand up. And, and, and has a ALK FOS level, which is one of the liver enzymes, five times what the highest normal value of it should be. And when I walked into this woman's house, I said, I, I'm literally at this point, I told her, I said, you're either, I'm gonna tell you certain things to do, you're either gonna do them or I can't work with you. 
you're going to get the dog on a fresh whole diet. And I started her out. I was like, if you can't do anything else, but go buy rotisserie chicken and sweet potato, then that's what you're going to do. But you're not going to feed that food anymore. And you're going to cut the gabapentin in half. And then we're going to cut it out all the way. And, and I told, you know, get off the, stop the Apoquil immediately. And let's hope the cancer doesn't come back. Although, although there's already two nodules in this dog's lungs. And, um, and then I, and, and then I looked at the blood work and there was this Alphos of a thousand. And I said, did they test your dog for Cushing's? Oh, I don't know. Let me call. So she called and she just so happened to get the internal medicine doctor picked up the phone instead of the receptionist. And I know him. I was sitting there. She put us on speaker. And I said, well, what do you think about this Alkfoss? It's over a thousand. Oh, I see that all the time. I really don't think there's anything to it. And I said, what, what about what about testing for Cushing's? Oh, well, if you, if you send the test out for Cushing's, there's all these false positives. So I just don't even bother anymore. And, and I'm like, I'm just, you know, well, I'm sitting there science. I, I'm just, my, I, I don't even know what to say. And I'm sitting there with the client and I'm not really going to get into the argument with him. So I said, I just said, you know what? I'll take care of it. I'll handle it. And so there exactly, where is the science and where is the medicine in this? You can't have a lab value that comes back five times what it should be glaring off the face of that lab work and not think there's something wrong with this dog. But I'm thinking it's probably coming from all the food and drugs that this dog is on. That is the, just literally putting the dog into spleen chi deficiency, blood deficiency, you know, and she, the dog had not get, gotten up on its own for a week. And she looked at me, she's like, well, if you can do a treatment on this dog and she stands up on her own, then, then we'll see, then I'll, then I'll go with what you're telling me. <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, <laughs> And the poor dog, the whole time, you guys, the dog is laying there, this Rottweiler, and her eyes were just boring into me. She was just like, just help me. I know you can help me, please. I just want to live. I don't know what's going on, but just help me. Give me some strength is what I was getting from that dog. And so she let me get acupuncture needles in her. We had to put a basket muzzle on her because I don't trust Rottweilers. And she she let me get some needles in her and stuff and and I took them out and I was packing up my stuff and damn if the dog did not get up <laughs> she stood up on her the woman went into the kitchen and she was messing around with the bags of dog food and that dog got up on her own and stood on her own four feet so that was like my my <laughs> yes <laughs> for last week but we'll see if we can pull her out of out of the madness but this is not this i've seen this is the pattern of dogs that i'm seeing right now these patients that are going she's seen an orthopedic surgeon she's seen an internal medicine specialist she's got three regular veterinarians and they just keep throwing drug after drug after drug with no nutrition going into them well um, one of the things that i have found over the years and i regret to say this is true with people physicians as well, um, they don't learn anything about nutrition in medical school. And the veterinary students have the additional disadvantage of being met by the dog food companies their first day on campus, getting freebie this and freebie that. Oh. And, you know, if you think about it, if you sell garbage food and make a profit doing that, mm -hmm. and that causes other problems in the dog, in effect, you're perpetuating your own business. I, my, my dad was a doctor and I used to go on hospital rounds with him. And he had a pocket full of individually wrapped candies that he would hand out to the children in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And at one point, and I couldn't have been more than 12 or 13 years old and a real big mouth. And I said, daddy, what are you doing? Making business for the dentist? <laughs> I mean, you know, but 
the same thing is true of veterinarians. And my friend Susan's son, Scott, mm -hmm. went to veterinary school, the University of Florida. So I know firsthand that the first people he met were the dog food companies. Mm -hmm. And when he heard about my raw food diet, he made as much fun of it as every other veterinarian. And then what did they these had corgi. I don't understand. They had a corgi. Susan and her husband had a corgi who was licking his paws to the point that the paws were orange. Mm -hmm. And Scott came down from Massachusetts to visit. And this is like several years after making fun of me. And when he looked at the dog, examined the dog, he said, you should put the dog on Mickey's raw food diet. <laughs> and the licking paws after three months went away. They did it. They did. They, but they actually did it. Yeah. Wow. Susan would come over with me and help do the grinding. That's okay. That's right. I remember. Yeah. Wow. Wow. But I, I don't understand where there's like a, it, it, how people can be so literally brainwashed because that's what it is. It's this programming to not think that, an, what did they think animals ate before there was processed food? You know, what do you think they're like dogs ate 500 years ago before Purina existed? It's just bizarre, you know? Well, it's also interesting that I am the granddaughter of somebody who had a pot on the back of the stove 24 mm. seven mm -hmm. because my grandfather was a hunter and a fisherman and his hunting pack were standard poodles. Oh, that's and my so. grandmother made food for them wow. 365 days a year. And she so, so she just had that pot on her stove and was just like throwing in the scraps and stuff probably, right? Yeah, like, scraps yeah. of vegetables. She'd add yeah. some chicken. I mean, I, obviously not as intense as what I'm doing, but <laughs> she wasn't feeding commercial dog food. And if you think about it, 75 years ago, they weren't really selling commercial dog food. No, they weren't. It came out around the Depression and World War II and stuff, really. But Well, it came out because they wanted to use waste products that couldn't go into people food, mm -hmm. which is why dog food plants and meat processing plants are generally side by side. So anything that's too sick, too diseased, too nasty to go into the people line gets shuttled into the dog food line. Yeah. And they take all the, they cut out all the, they cut, you know, when they're butchering the cuts of meat and things like that, they cut out all the, the cancerous tumors. And, and I, I saw this firsthand. I, I watched this with my own eyes and, and big ab, pu, abscess, pus filled abscesses <laughs> and infection sites and throw them in like big 55 gallon drums. And then they throw some activated charcoal in there and they wait till those fill up. They're not under refrigeration. They roll those big drums back into a back room of the slaughterhouse. And that stuff goes off to the rendering plant, but it sits there until like a semi full truck filled up with this putrid tissue. And then that gets turned into the beef meal and the chicken meal. But what I noticed just recently, you know, these, these companies play all these bait and switch tactics on their marketing and on what they put on their ingredient lists. And when I was over dealing with this Rottweiler the other day, I, I pulled out the bags of food. I'm always making people read the ingredient lists and they're not using chicken byproduct meal or chicken meal anymore. They're, they're saying plain chicken which makes people think that, oh, it's the good part of the chicken, blah, blah, blah. But I think they've actually, I think AFCOs, they've actually gotten those rules changed so they can put that on there. Because when I read the Hills bag, it sounded, the first five ingredients didn't sound too good. Well, the third ingredient was wheat gluten. And since this person was a, was a you know, 
knew stuff about human nutrition, I was like, what, what would you think if you ate just pure wheat gluten as the third ingredient of your diet? You, you think that might be the cause of your dog's IBD because the dog has IBD as well, you know, inflammatory bowel disease. But yeah, so they're using these bait and switch tactics now. And that's why that night I went home and I put up, um, I started going through the internet, looking at a few things and there's this whole new, because GMO, the label GMO got such a bad rap and people are no, are trying to get away from using eating GMOs. And there was the non GMO project and they have a, a little logo that they put on all the food. If there's no GMO ingredients in it, well, the, you know, during while we were all distracted by COVID in 2021, the USDA put forth a congressional act that said they can no longer use the non GMO project little logo, and that they now have to put on foods that do have GMOs in them, they put on bioengineered product bioengineered and it's this i put a facebook post up of it it's this logo that's this beautiful green field with sunshine <laughs> sunshine down coming down on the green field because bioengineered has got to be good for you so all of these genetically modified foods are now they're calling bioengineered and they've actually got um there were three apples gala and three other types of apples granny smith and something else that now have a trademarked brand name there's now a trademarked salmon because of the man-made genes inserted in its genome and there are trademarked um there's something else on there apples well they've gotten to potatoes they've gotten to um eggplant they've gotten to sugar beets of course soy you know so if you see this like pretty green field with the sun shining down on it, don't eat, don't eat the product. <laughs> but it's amazing. Yeah, Amherst. Uh, um, I was just wondering, um, because uh, Mickey's been such a, a long time since 1991, you were saying, as a raw feeder. Um, I'm just curious because... I'm I'm a pet parent and you know I, I like to know about these things. Um when you first started out, you said you mainly did chicken grind, but did at that point in time, were you th thinking of like grass fed, free roaming chicken, or you just bought, you know, uh whatever you could get your hands on, like in terms of budgeting, you know, how much how much do you think you spent? Um, and how much did you feed? you know, um, your dog on average, like a day. I'm just curious. And again, because I eyeball it in their dishes, mm. I don't measure. Right. Um, as far as organic or non-GMO, um, yeah, I try to be picky about what goes into the food, but Yep. It's gotten harder and harder to find the meat sources. And I'm now working with a butcher down south who is able to get things that publics won't even bother to get for me. Um, years ago, when I tried to figure out what it was costing me a day to feed, at the time, it was the golden retriever. Um, I figured it was about 50 cents a day. Wow. And of course, since then, prices have skyrocketed. But whatever I'm spending on the food I'm feeding them in the long run, in the long run is probably financially better than what I would be spending on cancer treatment and early death of dog and all of the other things that go with it. So, I mean, I'm at your house. I, well, I come and do an acupuncture treatment on Golda maybe every couple months, but the poodle, 
she's had, you know, she has a hair growing in her ears and that's like a grooming issue. All but cleaned I, out. Okay. She has not had, there's no reason for me to be there. She hasn't been on any drugs. No, we're not doing, she's not doing vaccines or doing heartworm preventative because we live with a ton of mosquitoes, but those dogs don't have, there haven't been issues. You know? Oh, that's amazing. Because I, I think for, for a lot of uh, new uh, pet parents who are coming into the concept of fresh, raw feeding for their animal, you know, uh, one of the things they were thinking about is cost, you know, um, how, and, and, you know, this is now there's this huge thing about, oh, it has to be, you know, organic is best or, you know, but frankly, because I'm a, a rescuer as well. So I do a lot of rescue work for like the community cats in my area. And, and so I have a budget, so I can't afford organic and, you know, all that, all that high tier stuff that, you know, they say is the best that if you can afford it, but I, I do my best with, within my budget for everyone. So at home, I've got 12 cats and one dog currently, and they're all raw fat. Um, but I try to rotate the brands, like the frozen um, brands that I get. I, I do a mix of uh, brands and DIY, you know, but I can't, I wish I could get a grinder like you because it's too expensive in Singapore where I live. It's, um, um, yeah, it's expensive to get a grinder <laughs> yeah. because everything has to be imported in here and we don't have... Um, agricultural land where you know we have local um, animals to kill so most majority of our food is imported in so you know for me it's like I just try my best to feed what I can you know um, and then I do supplementation because um, for me it's like I know that it's not the best quality meats and organs so, you know, I, I just do what I can and I, I give whatever um, other supplements to to boost the immune system or like bone broth, eggs, you know, whatever. And I would say still my animals thrive very well, you know, their lifespan, you know, in, in general. And I don't really see the vet that often for my home animals compared to say my the strays outside, which usually is because of accidents or abandonment issues or whatever, that that's where the, the bills go. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. no, um, honestly, I don't think, and uh, we've talked a lot about the GMO stuff, but I don't think she, and when she was getting the chicken necks at Publix and stuff, oh, that, nice. that, wow, that was nice. Wild Pacific. Those are from Costco here, which is a big kind mm. of big box store. Which but I yeah, I, I, think you're, I think you're better off feeding whole foods, even if it's not, even if it's feed like beef, which I'm not a big fan of, then you are the stuff out of the dog food bag, because mm -hmm. the stuff out of the dog food bag is even lower quality and it's rendered, it's baked away until there's no nutrients left in it, you know, mm -hmm. so and, yeah. you know, the truth is, if I can't get organic or grass fed or um, anything that I consider to be really healthy, I'm still going to buy the meat products yeah. because I think that doing it myself is better than buying it in a bag or a can. Um, yeah. Josie, how overweight was Amber when she came to us and couldn't stand up? She kept flopping over. Oh my god. About goodness. 15 pounds know. overweight. Yeah. Yeah. But and she you got the weight off of her. We got her off the Prozac. She came back to life. I mean, the dog literally came back to life. So it's well, a story of Amber. Even take her out to walk her because her rear end kept flopping over. She, her hips well, couldn't Amber support was, that extra weight. 
the Amber's owner had loved golden retrievers and she ended up dying and her daughter was decided to go to vet school and was living at home with Am with her father and her father was he was a judge actually down here and he was just all involved in his career and being a judge and all that and he wasn't the animal person so when when her mom died, Amber went into like, I think a depression and started chewing things up in the house. She chewed up this whole rug in their living room. And so- You didn't um, tell me that before we yeah. adopted her. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> but she never no. chewed anything here. So they took her and put her on the vet that she was seeing, put her on Prozac, and she called me in to do acupuncture on her because she was having a hard time walking around. And this dog was just so internalized. I couldn't even get, it was like a, there's a look that they get in their face when they're on, in their eyes where you can't even connect with them when they're on those antidepressants and those heavy drugs. And it's just like this zombie look. And I was like, I told, I told Kristen, I was like, we got to get her off these drugs. And um, actually I was working on another one of Kristen's dogs all the way through the COVID. But um, yeah, so then because Kristen was going off to Scotland to vet school, she's like, I'm really worried. My dad isn't going to watch her. He's not going to take care of her. She's on these medications. And that's when we called up, um, we called up Mickey. <laughs> But Call the Mickey. <laughs> exactly. And she took her in. And yeah. But yet once once you get them off the processed food and onto a whole food diet, the whole body composition changes. You know, well, they, they took that, that way back. back. I mean, my own dog, Molly, she's 12 years old. She, if you saw x-rays of her hips, people, I cringed when I saw them. She's jumping up into the back of my forerunner. She's jumping up back into the car, you know, and ready to go. So I, of course I've got her on, I've got her on herbs and a bunch of stuff, but it's, it can do amazing. Just the food alone, the body has to have those nutrients to repair. And so, yeah. so, you know, for new pet parents out there, like how much should they feed for their dog in terms of, you know, is that a calculation, you know, um, like how many cups of the meat mixture yeah. versus the vegetable mixture? Oh, no, I like go to, through. The, to the with the body weight of the dog, like how much food to feed the dog? Like if it's a 40 pound Don't dog? Measure. I, I can't give you an exact answer, but I, can't I go it. through two pounds of the meat mixture with the added sardines um, every day. For two wow. dogs, for a standard two dogs and two cats. And a, so and how heavy are they? Okay, okay, two dogs and two cats. So gold and is about the what, cats are both pounds. rescues too, Emrys. Okay, the dogs are fifty pounds each, okay. and okay. then the they're not big big dogs, but they're fifty pounds each at least. And then I'm thinking of Molly. She's eighty five. I give her like four kind of slider sized slices of raw like little mini hamburgers size mm -hmm. sliced off and some goat's milk or bone broth some sardines sewn on top maybe an egg here or there um and so that's like four ounces twice a day for an 85 pound dog so you feed when twice you a do day. egg do you do it raw or do you cook it at I all do it raw and you know what i get i don't worry about it i get the costco organic brown eggs i don't even wash them i just take the egg and crush it the whole thing in my fist shell and all and put it on her food i've been tempted to do that if she can't, if she can't handle if there's some salmonella on that eggshell and she can't handle it then her guts aren't healthy enough it's my thing she's on all this yeah. fermented food her guts are good to go Salmonella is not really a much of a dog problem because they are short gut animals. Exactly. Because people worry about the eggshell, but I just put the whole thing in there. You know? I mean, to be honest with you, I keep a bottle of alcohol on my kitchen counter because I'm working with raw chicken products. 
Yeah, when so we went to work, it gets wiped yeah. down yeah. a couple of times a day. Yeah. But I don't worry about salmonella for the dogs because it's not usually a short gut animal problem. And I mean, what we're doing in my house now, because we're doing Tom's, we're canning chicken for ourselves, but we're going to Costco sells like organic chickens to, to a package. And so he'll roast those for us and peel off all the good meat for us and then throw the bones in a pot. So we're making bone broth that he cans the good chicken in. And then we always have an extra bone broth. So we've got canned bone broth on the shelf. And then he's taking all the gristle and the skin and the bigger bones and stuff like that and grinding it just in it because it's cooked. So it's soft enough to grind, grinding it up and then it comes out like a, a mash almost like it like canned dog food and then we're canning that in bone broth to keep it moist so and the animals love that stuff it's got all the cartilage in there and the bone and the skin and all that stuff that we don't like to eat in soaking in bone broth you know so we're i we're stashing that to have stuff on the shelf so food. i'm I'm curious. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what does, you know, a, um, because raw fat dog, you've had generations of raw fat dogs, you brought them to the vet, maybe not so often, but when you do blood work, do the vets make any comments <coughs> with the blood work or, you know, the physical um, <coughs> look at your dog? The truth is that. <coughs> I don't really have a veterinarian other than Josie. Okay. Um, <laughs> Josie just did blood work on Golda in April. Yeah, that's right. And <laughs> so it was like um, a two year old dog's blood work. I mean, there was absolutely nothing on there that, you know, even, you know, no problems whatsoever. But I've had. Yeah, because you're, um, well, your last three, four dogs, I've been pretty much it, unless they have a problem, and then we send her to get the diagnostic somewhere, and <laughs> I send it with earplugs so they can't tell her about the, how horrible her raw food is. Well, you know, most of them don't even <laughs> ask me anymore, yeah. Yeah. and I don't offer it unless somebody asks me a direct <laughs> question. Right. Um, it's just, I'm not embarrassed about it anymore, but it's just not worth getting into a discussion with somebody who's totally ignorant about nutrition. Mm. Now, interestingly enough, I see an osteopath on a regular basis and they rotate her, his nurse, but I guess three visits ago, um, Ariel is with me and she looks like a very healthy dog. So she asked what I was feeding my dog. And I told her about the raw food diet. Oh, she wanted to learn more about that. So I said, fine, why don't you call me this evening and I'll tell you exactly what I do. And I've done this with a number of people, most of whom try it and then don't continue it. But I was pleasantly surprised because I saw this young woman again three weeks ago and she has a two-year-old dog that had been just moping around, <coughs> acting like a really old dog. And she said to me, I can't thank you enough for the information about the raw food diet. And I said, what do you mean? She said, my dog is acting like a puppy again. So that kind of, you know, if you're willing to go to the effort of making food for your animal, even if you're not getting organic, the best of the best of the best, yeah. whatever you're doing is better than selling, serving them McDonald's every day. Mm. 
do you do you fast your dogs at all or you just feed them twice a meal uh two times a day or you know what what, what? the a- answer is that i know that you should and the doctor who really promoted the barf diet recommended it the theory being that not every hunt was successful but i don't like to fast and i don't want to have to explain that to my dogs what i have done since josie well when they told me i needed to cut hold his leg off i one of my things back to the vet was how do i explain that to the dog um but it's just i think whatever effort you make what i'm doing now because josie recommended adding raw chicken bones and just letting the dogs chew them up themselves because that way they're not a uniform small grind the way they are you were you were doing that with the chicken backs when i met you though too you'd let them go out on the back porch right and i'm still doing the chicken backs but i'm not what i started doing when you recommended the raw necks was that I was giving that in addition to the chicken back. Oh, okay, okay. And now I'm alternating because I really think that three meals a day is too much. Yeah, yeah. So they're each getting about four raw chicken necks and then on alternate days, they're getting the chicken backs. Mm -hmm. And the chicken backs, if you see them, buy them, Josie, because I can't find them now. And I think I'm down to like a two day supply. Yeah, there's some really funky stuff going on with our food supply. Um, Well, they're burning chicken farms down. They're burning beef processing plants down. Somebody is sabotaging what we're doing. Well, and you know, there's this whole, I, I didn't tap into it much until yesterday, but the, the all, everything that's going on the, in the Netherlands, the farmers are out fighting to keep yep. their land. That's it's, right. Well, they want to turn it into farm. housing projects for illegal aliens. I, it's, yeah. Well, so in Singapore, we market. have a, we have a chicken crisis going on right now in Singapore because really? we can't get, um, Malaysia, which is our closest immediate neighbor up north of us, is a much bigger country. Um, They are not exporting chickens to us at the moment. So we have a chicken crisis. So not enough eggs and and chickens and guts and stuff. So, Mm. you know, and chicken is such a staple meat, you know, for most people. Chicken is so basic. Not everyone can afford beef, lamb, because that's actually considered more expensive here. So chicken is really basic meat stuff and um i'm having problems raise them buying... raise them on your balcony <laughs> oh i can't I, I wish i could i wish i could but i can't I, the, the 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 government regulations here i would but you know it's not right yeah. but we have wild jungle fowl downstairs roaming free range they're like the wild chickens the ones that yeah, fly yeah. you know yeah. and um but we I have can't a, find their nest. I wish I could, then I could steal some eggs, but I can't find them. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody else has already found the nest. No, it's a serious problem. I don't, it's very strange times we live in right now. But mm. um, yeah, like I say, I think people, people have to be less afraid of just feeding real meat, real food to their dogs, meat, vegetables, you know, <laughs> it's okay. They're not, it's, they actually do so much better. So, yeah, I mean, like I have, I have some fat parents who are scared of germs and I say, look, if you cook for yourself and you do basic standard hygiene of washing up and cleaning up after before and after you know you do your prep work you yeah. shouldn't have a problem you know and i i i chuckle because like sometimes people tell me like um like their dog sitter um doesn't know how to feed raw i'm like what do you mean you don't know how to feed raw you just open up you know and that's put it in the bowl <laughs> you take a spoon and put it in the no container cooking and it involved <laughs> 
I'm such a, I am a lazy raw feeder. So I grind <laughs> up my vegetables for me and my dog to share, you know, um, and, and the raw <laughs> yeah. food and stuff, you know, uh, very lazy. I don't have, you know, like on social media, they have the pretty, pretty looks of those raw food preps and mine doesn't no. look like that. Mine is just home style <laughs> cooking, you know, <laughs> as, as raw as it gets, everything's mixed up in, 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 a, in a plate you know, for, for my dog and she wallops everything. And it's really strange because I meet dog owners who say like, oh, their dog takes forever to eat their food. And I say, what do you feed your dog? Oh, they eat dry food or, you know, usually it's dry food. And it yeah. takes maybe like half an hour sometimes. So that's why they leave the, the dry food out for the dog 24 seven, like a buffet service. And I'm like, well, and I said, well, my dog whacks the food down in, you know, like a couple of seconds. So I'm trying to like <laughs> make sure my dog doesn't like choke herself. But other than that, like even my cats, they, when they eat raw, it's really fast. It's like, you know, just a few minutes and it's gone, you know? Exactly. So my cat just inhales what food's in her bowl. And then she's usually done before the dog. And then the dog comes over and licks whatever she Yeah, same, in. same. You know, so I find it very interesting when I hear pet parents who say like, oh, my cat or my dog takes forever to eat. And usually, you know, when I ask them, what do they feed? It's usually dry food, you know? And I said, well, maybe your animals try to tell you something that they don't actually like the food. Exactly. You know, but they don't like um, it. Or they know food. it's not good for them. Mm, instinctively, they know. They can probably smell the chemicals that the did, you know, all that stuff, the bad stuff. Although... One of the things the pet food industry does is add things to the food that sort of addicts the animal to that food. Yes, they do. Palatins, right? That's yes. what it's called, I think. Yeah, they they and they spray it down. Well, they spend millions of dollars trying to figure out how to get how to get a cat to eat extruded industrial waste products. How do you, to get a cat to eat something is a major ordeal <laughs> unless it's, you know, so they spray it down. But I know that stuff's addictive because when you try to take a cat off of dry food and get them to eat real meat, it is so difficult sometimes. Mm. No. It's also what they're, with cats, it's also what they're exposed to when they're babies too. It's like what mom brings to the nest to say, this is okay to eat. Here's dinner. That's mm. a big issue with them. So that's why I say with cats, especially raising kittens, it's like feed them a little bit of everything, you know, and then they won't be so picky when they're adult cats. Well, my rescues are happy to eat. So yeah, what's put in front you of you? You had them young and you were feeding them a lot of, <laughs> they were getting dry food from the neighbors and then your real food at home. So they were getting a little bit. Yeah, involved. they eat out. Yeah, I mean, like my community cats downstairs, uh, we feed a mix of wet canned food and raw because mm -hmm. some cats take the raw, some don't, but, you know, we, we mix it up. Um, and we know because they're, they're outside cats, they eat, you know, crap, they eat kibble, whatever that, you know, comes their path. They do kill rats and birds as well, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the ones that my volunteer group personally feed, our version of you know as fresh as we can afford with the wet canned food um they look healthier they're cleaner they're not obese um mm -hmm. and they tend to live very well until their time is up and then when it's time for them to go they go really fast that mm -hmm. that's been my observation instead of dragging it out um mm -hmm. they go really really fast when it's their time to go so, well, yeah. Amber, for example, yeah. after living with us for five years, she did have that episode of a seizure about six months before. Uh-huh. That's right. But that didn't happen again. And one morning, she just walked into the kitchen, walked over to me, said hello, and then walked to the rug by the porch door and stretched out and went to sleep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
So there were no decisions to make, you know, I mean, it was just, but she lived with us for five years after we adopted her. Yeah, and she was already up there. I mean, not well, right there. She was lot. 13 when we got her. Yeah, so it's not, and it, that's why it's never too late to switch them over, you know, because if you think if she was 13, around 13, and she'd been on all these drugs and could barely get up and walk, and you got her switched over diet wise, I was there treating her with acupuncture and stuff, but she lived an awesome five more years. And, you know, it's pretty, it's remarkable. That's why <laughs> the test, just the testament of the, your dog, your dogs, it's a testament to fresh feeding, raw feeding, huge. Um, and you're not Mickey, doing, you know? Yeah, Mickey, I'm curious. Um, your family, you know, um, when you started to feed raw, were they on board with it or was there resistance or, you know, like half believers, you know, how, how was, what was that like for you? Well, none of my kids do the raw food diet, but um, here at home, because I was making a milk-free diet for one kid and a soy-free diet for another kid. And, you know, I already had all of these different things I was juggling that making food for the animals was like, mm -hmm, that's what mom does. Um, Jonathan has two rescued cats, our middle son, who are both overweight. They look like small dogs. They're so big. One of them is big enough to punch the ice dispenser on their refrigerator because he likes ice. <laughs> um, but they're on both canned and bagged food. And I understand that they're really busy and they don't have time for the raw, but they're not interested in it either. Yeah. So when I find somebody who is, I'm more than happy to teach them about the raw because I really believe it's the healthiest thing to do for your animal. Yeah. Yeah. I, and as far I, as resistance from the rest of the family, <clears throat> um, even Richard, who only comes into the kitchen to eat, when my source of chicken from Publix dried up, he's the one who said, just find a butcher. <laughs> and Which so on a Saturday time. when I thought I was going to be devoting the day to grinding I'm on the phone trying to find a butcher mm -hmm. but it was his suggestion mm. yeah. well I think it's amazing that you've been doing this for such a long time you know when when Dr. Josie was telling me because she was so excited to to get you to talk to us, you know, and I was just like, wow, you know, to actually meet someone who's been doing it for years, like decades, um, it's, it's very refreshing because um, it's not, not publicly common knowledge, you know, for people to, I, I don't know, I mean, I mean, like, honestly, like Dr. Josie, I think on social media, not that many people we know say that they've been feeding for like decades, you know. No, there aren't. There really yeah. aren't. You know, yeah. I've only been doing it um maybe I don't know, 10 years plus, 12 years, something like that. Yeah. You know, I'm considered for a good long time. You yeah, know? you know, in terms of today, so mine is long, but but I actually think that, well, you know, I think this should, should be a longer history. So to find yeah. you and get to speak to you today is it's a real treat. And honor, you. honestly, you know, um, for for really making the time to share your stories because I think it's I love listening to stories. Number one, Dr. Josie knows that, and <laughs> and the fact that you know you the way you tell it is like you just started, you know, with whatever you could find and you just ground it up and, you know, and you eyeball it. That's what mummies do, honestly, you know. Exactly. <laughs> it's not it's calculations and all this craziness. You know, if the dog's getting fat, you feed him a little less. If the dog's too skinny, you feed him a little more. That's yep. 
Yeah, my body condition. Right weight, Josie? Hmm? Are my dogs the right weight? Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, no, they're both. Yeah. <laughs> and then she worries so much, but I mean, her poodle literally, she's got the most beautiful coat and, you know, it's soft and silky and yeah. And I think it's amazing, you know, what, what you're doing. And, and I love the fact that the way you're saying it is so matter of factly, you're so humble, you know, you, you don't, you don't you know like blow a big uh, loudspeaker on it but I just think you know I can't imagine that the amount of crap you get from other other professionals um, who don't believe in in the fresh raw feeding concept will blame whatever they find on your dogs on that you know um, no because- the cancer was because of the raw food diet and now she's five years cancer free from a soft tissue sarcoma like i want to blare that out to the world yeah that that is amazing and it's so hard to convince um some dog parents sometimes because you know they're so number one they really trust and believe that the vet knows best right that that's that's the thinking the vet has gone through school they've got this degree and they should know everything there is to know and i and they believe that they should know nutrition that's that's the mm-hmm. irony of ironies you know um till today till today and i well, think the it, same thing is true for human doctors mm-hmm. but i think we they, give our power away to like it being a vet people believe that should be certain ways but it goes one more step than that they give their power away to the veterinarian or doctor and instead of it being a healer doctor patient relationship working together to bring that patient, which I think maybe that comes more from my traditional Chinese medicine thing, because in there, like the family cooks for the patient in the hospital. (laughs) That's how much, you know, the traditional hospitals in China way, way back, the family comes in and cooks the broths for the patient that's sick in the hospital. Um, I think think it helps also because Mickey, you were saying, um, in the past, it was easy for you to understand the concept of raw feeding for for your dogs because you already had skin babies who had health issues. And so you were already on the ball about nutrition and diet. And, you know, like you were already like you're saying, you know, soy free for one child, you know, or dairy free for another yeah. child. So you were already like very self-aware of what, food the power of food can do um uh whether it can create havoc or or health for 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 a child for you know um you could actually translate that into the dog the animal kingdom when it came to the diet part i think well and i also learned very early on with my children that you have to read labels Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah you know, a corn sensitivity means that anything with DEX, dextrose, is ruled out. But if you don't know to read the labels, and people don't read the labels and don't understand yep. them. I'm, I'm guilty as food. well. I don't know. I don't know. It's yeah. because when they, it's this huge paragraph of all of this stuff. And no, they, and they're tiny, tiny print because I can't read them. <laughs> Even by reading the glasses, I can't read them. <laughs> No. Years ago, when I started reading labels, it wasn't as hard. But now you can take a loop with you and look at the labels in the store. So, you know, but oh, yes, that's most so people true. never look at the label. Yeah. No, they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't look at the label on the on the brevecto that says may cause seizures for your dog. Every time they <laughs> advertise that. Oh. Every time they advertise that on TV, I tell Richard, that's, that yeah. should be forbidden because that causes the neurological damage that they're warning people about, we but it's like a throwaway ago. line yes, and ago, nobody hears it. A few years ago when I was, uh, when I had a rescue dog 
that was very, very sick. Um, the vet actually told the rescuers that Brevecto will help with the dog's skin condition. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's why the dog was on Brevecto. But the dog was in kidney failure and the off the charts, the machine couldn't read it. And it was like oh, stated to be euthanized, like within a month kind of thing. And but I took it home and then it, I just fed it raw. You know, we didn't have the budget for, you know, medical fees. So I just fed it raw with my supplements and whatever stuff I could afford. And the dog mm-hmm. lived for like 15 months and 13 days after that. But a good life. The palliative care was the golden years. He walked for hours. You know, he had the energy and his skin healed, you know, and stuff. But can you imagine? The vet actually took the, the rescuers that Provecto was good for the skin. That's why the dog had to be in Provecto. And I'm like, uh-uh, it's coming off it. You know, um, I, yeah, I, I tried to make it count. Yeah, I get frustrated because I, I, even being a veterinarian, I'll talk to people and they're like, well, this doctor told me this and this, and, and they won't, they'll believe that over what I may tell them as well. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Mm -hmm. it's, it's just, you know, I think the internet is, you know, a blessing and a, and a curse at the same time, because you have so much information that conflicts and you actually for the discerning pet parent, you must have that willpower to actually go through the crap and sieve it out, you know, and to really try and find the truth, which is so hard sometimes. But I feel really blessed that I found, you know, doctors like uh, Dr. Josie as well, um, you know, and I don't know, it's been what, two years, I think, or since yeah, I heard you. Yeah, it has. You know, and I just last feel few like, years have been really wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, you know, and I just I just feel so blessed, you know, that I've I found vets like her who who have been fighting the system or you know doing their own thing, you know, doing and, my and, own thing underground. <laughs> yeah, but practicing real medicine, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. as opposed to throwing band-aids on stuff to cover up and maybe make worse whatever is going on with the animal and it's it's just for me it feels like it's getting worse it's like people are almost just throwing in the towel you know it's like this internal medicine person not wanting looking at that elk foss and he, he i've known the man for 20 years he's been in practice a long time and i know he knows better but it's just, there's this thing happening. I think people are just like, I don't know if they're just overwhelmed, if they're tired, if they're like, whatever, you know? But I, it's, it's, it's interesting, let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mickey, so much. And I am going to, for the whole um, group, I'm going to type up your your list that you sent me, which is kind of like her ingredient list and her way of doing it. And so people can try it out. You got I'm a going new one? to give you a more complete one because okay. so much of it yeah. is, you know, yeah. I do it from yeah. memory. And I walk well, and around. What's the available? Because you're rotating. It's not like, and, and I think that's the best way to do it. You don't do, you don't feed the same thing all the time. We don't eat the same thing every day. So if, when you go to the store, and especially in this day and age, if you go to the store and you find something on sale, you might want to buy a bunch of that up. You know, so. Well, or there are other things that you can't find at all. Yeah. Or there's things that are in season. I mean, I just renewed my um, community supported agriculture um, subscription last night, Susan and I did because the farmers out, he's actually looking for more farmland out in the Redlands to be able to plant more vegetables. But I, you know, for me, food security is, is I will pay a little bit extra to know I've got somebody growing those organic vegetables for me, so. Send me that information. I will. I will. I'll send you the link because it he may fill up really quick, and he's taking he's taking the new subscribers for next year already. 
So he doesn't plant down here. Our growing season's opposite. So he starts planting in September and October. Right. To harvest but, in the spring. Yeah. Um, well worth it though. Okay. I guess the other thing is that fortunately I have freezer space. So when cranberries are on sale in the fall, I buy them and just pop them right in the bag in the freezer. The same yeah. thing with blueberries. I have a vacuum sealer. So I'll buy blueberries and seal them up, throw them in the freezer. Those so, vacuum sealers are great. We have one of those as well and it really saves. And what it means is that when blueberries aren't in season, if I wanna throw blueberries into a mixture, then I take them out of the freezer and I defrost them. Um, you can't mm -hmm. do that with a lot of the fruits and vegetables, but the things that I can, I stock up on when they're in season and then I'm able to use them at different mm -hmm. times of the year. But not every batch has blueberry, not every batch has cranberry. Um, and if I can't find, decent looking spinach, then I'll add a little extra kale or a little extra collard greens. So you, this is kind of my basic go-to. This is what I'd like to have in every mixture, but it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. So, <laughs> Right. Well, that's like we, natural seasons, you know, we don't have every single vegetable and fruit in season all the time. There's, you know, there's the the, the, the good season and then you've got plenty and then you've got none. And it's a right. cycle. Everything's a seasonal cycle, which yeah. I think is, is perfect what you're doing, to be honest. And, and it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Exactly. Well, and one of the things I learned from the doctor who saved our youngest life, literally, David stopped growing at six months. There was no measurable growth from six to 13 months. He actually lost three pounds from six to nine months. And there was no measurable growth until he was past 13 months old and Dr. Sandberg was already treating him. But one of the things that he stressed was eat what's in season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And so having so grown up in the low country of South Carolina, which is kind of like a fruit and vegetable bowl for the East Coast, um, I was used to having fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, and it's still pretty much the way I cook for people today. So to extend that to the animals was an easy step. Yeah. If if you you know if um a new pet parent came up to you and said, Mickey, why should I feed raw? What would your answer be really simply? Well, my standard answer is if you had a child, would you feed him a can of Chef Boy RD every day? When you look at it from a nutritional point of view that would just be crazy. So why would you serve something out of a bag or a can to a helpless animal every day when you wouldn't do that to a child? Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And thank you for you know, making You go to time. McDonald's once in a while as a treat for a kid, yeah. but it's not three meals a day, seven days a week. Mm. Yeah. True, true, true. <laughs> well, thank so, you. Yep. Josie, um, thank you for all of your kind words. Um, I'm really honored to have been able to do this with you. I know. You're amazing, Mickey. Thank you so much. Thank you thank so you. much. <laughs> no, really. It's a real I, honor to meet you. Real honor to meet you. Yeah. I appreciate that, but I, I don't think I'm doing anything that different or that special.
And that's well, where the hero doesn't know how 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 heroic they are. <laughs> right? right. Right, exactly. But she's gonna be. She's in the group. She's in the gateway to Gaia, and anybody can message her, and you can check your. So you have to check your private messages, um, Mickey. And okay, I haven't done that. You know, it's, yeah, it's really so cool. yeah. But people can message her if you have questions or anything else. She is. She loves to help people out too. So, and I'm gonna put up all your information on how you do it. Because we've got, okay. we've got. I'm going to um, send you an amended list because, yeah. you know, I thought about these different things like the bone broth. Um, yeah, exactly. Just the add-ons, and we all do that kind of stuff. Like I should, I'd really have to sit down and think about everything my dog eats. <laughs> well, I'm glad to know about the eggs because yeah, the, the eggs calcium in the, the shell, mm -hmm. just, you know, why throw that away if you can give it yeah and there's that membrane inside the shell that's filled with hyaluronic acid too you know that real thin membrane inside the eggshell that's really good for dogs billy hoekman's okay. big on that he taught me that i wanted to do it and i kept meaning to ask you and i i kept forgetting so i'm yeah. glad to know that i can just crush an egg in yeah just crack an egg um <laughs> you know the the biggest thing is that Next birthday, I'm going to be 80. Wow. My goodness, yeah. you are. Wow. You don't look 80. Can oh. I just say this? You you really <laughs> don't look it. You don't act it. You know, It's her um, good cooking and her good nutrition. I know. This <laughs> right? is a raw fat mama. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, I, am, I wish that we ate as well as my dogs. Although Josie tells me that my dogs eat better than most people. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as I get older, you know, it's more and more of a challenge to yeah. grind everything up. And yet I know I have to do it. And so I'm going to set aside a day next week and do the fruits and vegetables again because it's time yeah. maybe, maybe we you should you should find an apprentice you mm -hmm. know like someone who is really genuinely interested in feeding raw and then you you can you can say like come over and you help me do this and you can learn how to do it you know um and the day when the day comes that maybe you're physically not strong enough to do it your apprentice can take over whether it's for free or for a little fee, you know, hey, but at least you've got someone in training. Or start Jersey like a cooperative. Yeah, food for thought. We should start like, it's so hard to get people together these days, you know, it's like everybody is so pulled apart. Because you're both in in Florida. Yeah, in the same we're, yeah. yeah, yeah. To start a, even a cooperative to make dog food, but yeah. yeah. Just like, you know, teach teach newcomers maybe like you know how to do it simple um you know uh within your budget kind of thing that that hands-on yeah. experience that will make a difference especially for people who might say like say for me i might not be able to afford a grinder but hey if i can learn from you and grind my own mm -hmm. you know for for a small fee that might help that might help educate as well yeah but yeah yeah i Dr. Josie, send me an apprentice because I'm about to make the fruits and vegetables again. <laughs> um, oh, I wish I lived near you. I'll be there. I would. I, uh, I would. I love to teach this, and I've taught several people. Whether they've stuck with it or not, I don't know. But so anybody in our group are listening to this, if they if they're interested in, she lives. Mickey lives in South Miami. Um, and you can contact me for information. Yeah. You know, doctor, you know, I, is that I know somebody who is doing the uh, freeze drying for people products. Wow. And I have suggested to him that they consider expanding into a dog food line 
because if you freeze dried the meat and the fruits and vegetables, they would mm. be shelf stable. They mm. wouldn't depend on refrigeration. And I think it would be something that people would actually buy who don't want to go through the trouble of buying a grinder and buying a blender and, you know, yeah. doing yeah. the work. Yeah, I actually buy um, freeze-dried uh, meat products for my animals because obviously I can't get everything on the shelf here easily. So I mix and match. So like what how I feed is really a um, a mixture of commercial and freeze dried, raw, air dried, you know, frozen, fresh DIY, you know, and I and I rotate because it's really based on my budget and resources, the availability of resources as well. Because since COVID, the last couple of years, just logistics for shipping and supply and demand, you know, has has been hit um quite a fair bit. Um but you know going back to how you would love to teach people this dr josie i'm thinking for just the reverence like the, the, um our online yeah. group maybe she could do a live demo i have wanted to do a live demo with her forever and maybe we maybe i need to just go over there and we do it as best we can yeah i, I i'm can't. thinking just, just for our community right in your right in your kitchen yeah clear off that one counter she her kitchen is like her kingdom <laughs> but can, um, and maybe i should when you do your vegetables we can do the vegetables ah there you, you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah There's so i'm yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think, think our community that. would love that would love that yeah. honestly. i have to do the fruits and vegetables one day next week so mm. so maybe um if you do it friday i'll set aside friday do it Friday with you. Let me just look at the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> if, we don't, if we don't put this in our schedule, you like got to schedule it to confirm it. Yeah. If I were here talking right now on the mm. on the podcast, yeah. because I was like, no, we're gonna do this because yeah, because this is this is good time. stuff. Yeah, this will be really helpful for new pet parents, honestly. You know, to give them the confidence as like, hey, if this 80 year old grandmother can do it, why can't I? And she's Honestly. been feeding how many dogs all the way through and they all have incredible stories, you know? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's okay. amazing. So that's a plan then. So well, I'm going <laughs> to. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Mickey. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. It was a pleasure. It wasn't as scary as I thought it would be, Josie. Oh, right. why would it be scary? You thought it was going to be scary. I said it's we're not scary. <laughs> we're not scary. We're quite sitting, funny. It's like <laughs> sitting out of everything. People, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's just like having a coffee, you know, having a cup of tea. Exactly. Exactly. That's yeah. how I want. This is good so practice for your live easy. Zoom. For, for your yeah. live workshop with grinding your fruits and vegetables. We're gonna do it. So I'm gonna be on the. I'm gonna text you. This will be so exciting. It. Everyone will love it. Yeah. Really. Yes. Yeah. They would. They would. They would. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> All right. Have a great weekend, you guys. Okay. Take nice care. Nice meeting you. Good to see okay. you, Jesse. Wow. I'm so thankful and grateful that you took the time to listen to this podcast. It would mean the world to me if you could subscribe, download rate, review, and share this with others whom you care about that may enjoy it as well. Thank you, and remember to be kind to yourself and others. Have a awesome day, everyone.